All right. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all of you who are here with us from wherever you are in the world. I'm Josh Garrison coming at you from beautiful, sunny Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. What's up, Walnut Creek? Um, I have an icebreaker for you. I also have an incredible speaker joining us today. We've got Jamal Reimer. We're going to give people a little bit of time to trickle in before we get started. Um, but real quickly, icebreaker, what's the biggest deal you've ever closed? Drop it in the chat. And uh, Jamal, I'm going to ask you, what's the biggest deal you've ever closed? You, you want to hear that now? I want to I wanna know. 56 million. 56 million. Does anybody in the chat top 56 million? Hey, I'm, I know they're out there. Uh, my deals are not the biggest deals, especially with telco and government sellers. Yeah, we didn't invite those guys. Those uh, <laughs> Raytheon salespeople are not allowed. Joshua <laughs> Nieves, 56 million and one cent. Ray says a million. Alan's got 1.4. TJ says almost 300K. Tom's got 385. Tony Lee, four, Rick Schmidt, 40 million in real estate. I like real estate is like a, almost a different thing, but it's impressive nonetheless. Uh, 4.2, 40K. I'm trying to figure it out. 2.5, Chris Cherry. CC, I didn't mean guys to be uh, gendered. You're right. I didn't invite those folks. 35 million from Joven. Nice. 2.7 million from Matt. <clears throat> okay. How to close the chat. All right. If you guys don't want to be in the chat tab, click on the, instead of chat, click on messages or click on poll, click on messages. You can just <clears throat> go to another tab and you won't see the chat. We are one minute past the top of the hour. Uh, I am going to kick the show off. So let's get into it, y'all. All right, here's our agenda for the day. I'm going to run us through a little bit of housekeeping. Then I'm going to tee up your guest speaker for the day, the reason we're all here, Mr. Jamal Reimer. Jamal's going to run us through some of his mega deal secrets for closing the biggest deals of your life. At that point, I'm going to pop into Apollo. I'm going to show you guys three ways to break into enterprise mega deal ready accounts using the Apollo platform. Jamal's going to pick it back up, drop his third secret, and then we're going to run into a Q&A. People are asking, do you record? The answer is yes, we will send you a recording. Um, of course, this is sponsored by my employer, Apollo, the world's only end-to-end -end sales engine. If you don't have an account, I recommend you create one for free, but I'm also going to show you why and how in the demo portion. Uh, so here's our housekeeping. We're recording this session. If you leave, I'm going to be offended. It's going to keep me up at night, but I'm still going to send you the recording uh, within 48 hours from today. We also always post these on our website and we always post them on YouTube. Um, if you have questions, please try and drop the questions in the Q&A tab, not in the chat tab. I keep an eye on the chat tab, but uh, it's overwhelming. As you guys know, we will take your Q&A at the end. And then lastly, the chat is not the right place to try and sell your products or services. Use Apollo to do that. Get into people's DMs. Please don't spam the chat. We'll boot you from the webinar. We'll ban you from all future webinars. It's just not worth it. Uh, okay. I'm Josh Garrison. I'm the head of content marketing and customer education here at Apollo. I've spent most of my career, as some of you know already, as a sales leader at companies of various sizes. And I am incredibly honored and excited to introduce Jamal Reimer, one of the world's best enterprise sellers who brought in over $150 million at Oracle. This guy is the man. Jamal, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to let you take it away. Oh, yeah. Generous, generous uh, opener. I really appreciate that, Josh. Uh, let me start getting into this. I'm going to share some slides to guide the conversation. Give me just a quick sec here. All right. You guys see what I got going? Okay. So today I want to talk with you about some pretty aspirational stuff. You know, the title is how to close the biggest deal of your life, but really this is about how to achieve all the hopes and dreams that you had when you first got into B2B sales. And this is a really important topic for me because you see, I speak with sellers like hundreds of sellers every week. And it's getting more and more clear to me that given the downturn in the economy and the 
preponderance, like 90 plus percent of tech companies, the kinds of sales motions that they run are putting sellers further and further behind in their financial goals, in their performance goals, and it's hitting us in many negative ways. How many can you relate? Say, I do. I relate. I, do. I relate to what's going on. Yeah. Now, so today I wanted to share the three biggest secrets that move the needle in my career, my 20 year career as an individual contributor. And I want to do that to help you get back on track if you feel that you're off. Now, with your permission, I'd like to speak with you very plainly. I want to speak to you in the voice of the coach. And what I mean by that is, mm -hmm. I want to tell you what I know that you need to hear, even if it isn't all, 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 you know, a bed of roses, because I believe that life is too short to just be another talking head doing another thought leadership session. Do I have your permission to do that? Do I have your permission to speak plainly? Give me a yes. Oh, I think we got all the yeses coming in the chat right now. We got, we got a lot of yeses. Okay. All right. Here we go. So guys, stated differently, <clears throat> the goal that I have for this session is to show you how learning how to find and close uncommonly large deals, mega deals, 10x the size of your current average deal size. I want to show you that learning how to do this is the only way that you are going to have breakout success as a B2B seller. And I know that this is a bold claim, but I do this. This is, this is my work, right? This is now my mission. I've had students go from 150 K average deal size to hit a $4 million deal. I've had another one go from 400 K average deal size to doing 10 million and believe me beyond as well. So I truly believe that learning the way of the mega deal and with the secrets that I'm going to share, I want to save you a decade of trying to figure it out on your own through trial and error. And I want you to believe this as strongly as I do. And I want you to believe it so much that I want you to make a commitment to yourself. Are you okay with making a commitment to yourself? So I want you to think of it like this. I commit that as soon as I know that the way of the mega dealer is what I want in my career, and the way of learning how to do mega deals is the way to catapult myself into being an elite seller, I will go all in. Just put all in in the chat. All in. We've got, we've got all ins. We've got yes. we got 100%. We, these these awesome. folks are bought in. They want the secrets. They want the okay. heat. All right. I don't want any dabblers here, so I'm glad we've got the right audience here. So let's start by um, making a comparison just to, just to show the distance that we have to go. So, you know, if, if you follow my content on LinkedIn, I talk a lot about the difference between run rate sellers and selling above the clouds, these elite sellers. What is life like for a run rate seller? It's filled with frenetic, high volume activity, getting stuck with low level stakeholders, small deals that nobody talks about and that take forever, disappointing commissions, financial stress. Can anybody relate? Is anybody there right now? I was there for a full decade of my career, so I know what this is all about. Now, the elite seller, on the other hand, activity, working with executive stakeholders, doing really large deals that not only bring great commissions, they also have massive impact, and they ultimately lead is on the other side of your first intentional mega deal. I'd go far to say all the things that we want in life are fueled by the craft that we perfect. Our, our, the role you want, the relationship, the, the, the lifestyle that you want, all these things are fueled by our craft. And that's why this is so important. And that's why mega deals are so key to this process. And I know this because I've lived it. Now, I want to tell you my story I need to stop sharing for that. Now, the part of my story that is probably the most instructive is the biggest part of my low because it's from that low that it became a high. So 
picture back when I was a younger guy. I didn't have any gray hair. It was around 2006. I was in a role and I wasn't doing well. I had been fired from my previous role. So in the role that I was in during this story, I'll take you back to this moment. Two, two quarters ago, I had a goose egg. Last quarter just ended last night, last night. And I had another goose egg. And I was sitting in my cube, deer in the headlights. My boss tapped me on the shoulder, said, Theo, Theo was our CEO. Theo wants to see you in his office 30, 7.30 tomorrow morning. That was an uncommon request and I knew what was coming. So the shot of adrenaline coursed through my body. It was fire and ice and I, I just knew that that was my end. So after a sleepless night, I made my way into the office early. I knocked on Theo's door. He didn't even look at me. He just said, come in. I sat down and the conversation was short and certainly not sweet. He said, well, the previous quarter you didn't perform. And now I see this last quarter you also didn't. So we need to let you go. Ruben will see you out and you'll get the rest of the details by email. Magically, Ruben, our head of sales ops, appeared in his doorway and motioned me for me to go with him. And I, we walked to my cube and I could just feel his eyes on the back of my neck. And it's like I felt all of a sudden I felt like I was a criminal. And I walked to my cube. <clears throat> There was a there was a, a box on the desk. It was all pre-planned. I grabbed my stuff, put it in the in the box, and then he escorted me out of the building and watched the door close and lock before he went back to the office. Has anybody, <clears throat> anybody been escorted out of a building? I was standing on the street corner with this half-filled box. I looked to the right, looked to the left. I didn't know what to do. So that's enough of that. It was only like two months later that I got my next gig and it was with massive Oracle. And it was a really tough gig. But let me fast forward. Because a couple of years later, I got married, moved to Sweden, stayed with Oracle, and I got put on this account that was in a lot of trouble, but it was a renewal year. And I had my head of sales and my head of services who had done this before. They had, they had been through this rodeo. And long story short, that was my first transformational deal. We took a customer who was a $10 million customer, and they went to $53 million in nine months. And then <clears throat> I guess the lesson stuck because ultimately, I mean, I had all these great accolades, right? So this guy who was fired twice in a row became number one, 1% at Oracle. I closed $160 million worth of business in eight years, largely by doing multiple $50 million deals. And now I think you can see my passion this is what I do. I just want to help other people get there too. So let's get to the teaching, right? There are these three secrets that move the needle in my career. And I know that they can move the needle in yours. The first secret is not uh, a strategy. It's really about the reality that we live in. And as I go through it, I hope it really makes you mad. And I hope it makes you mad enough to dive into the changes that you're going to need to do to get to the other side. The other two are the most important skills that you're going to need. Okay. So let's just jump right in. Secret number one is why you will never overachieve by following the rules of the system. And Jamal, do you want to share your screen again? Yeah. Great. And uh, I'm just going to hop in the chat. Hey, y'all, there's some really good stuff coming here. We don't just, uh, we don't play, you know, if you guys have been to the webinars before. So uh, stick around. I promise it's going to be worth it. We're getting into the three major secrets of deal closing right now. Let's, let's do it. Guys, we live in a matrix. We are players in a game that are designed and controlled by very powerful people. And this should not be a surprise to you. The venture capital and private company, uh, uh, private equity companies are the owners. 
They put in place management teams to operate these businesses. The management teams put us in place to execute on those plans. But the motivations and the drivers for the owners and us individual contributors are wildly different. So the truth mm -hmm. is individual contributors have the greatest chance of success on paper. We got these great kickers and it's amazing if we get there, but the lowest chance of success in practice. What do I mean? You guys know Ryan Walsh? He's the founder and CEO of RepView. I know you guys go to RepView a lot to kind of benchmark where you're at. Here's what he said just a few months ago. I was a CRO of a public SaaS company. Less than 50% of my team was hitting quota, but the reality was that I didn't need to have that many of them to hit for me to succeed. If only 50% of them hit, we were going to hit the number. It's just a spreadsheet exercise funded by huge VC rounds. Now the money's drying up and the layoffs are here. So the truth is that the plan is structured so that owners can win even if you fail. The system doesn't care about us, doesn't care about you, doesn't care about, it doesn't respect your skills. It doesn't care how much effort you put in. If anybody could sit in your role and perform at their expected level, they'd be happy. But that doesn't mean they don't want you to be there. It just means that they have certain expectations. And those expectations create a natural conflict between owners and individual contributors. And it comes down to predictability versus overachievement. So owners want predictability. They want to see this nice, consistent growth month in, month out, quarter, year, quarter in and out, year in and year out. And where they can, they want to limit our ability to create revenue that's unpredictable. Let me tell you something. We want overachievement. Overachievement is not predictable in most cases. Now, let me, let me give some examples. So overachievement, this is not for everybody's comp plan, but order of magnitude, this is kind of what it looks like. To overachieve, if you're just at 100% of your number, you're going to make about 250K, maybe 350 in the good old days, you know, over the last year. But to get 200%, that's going to bring you about half million. That's pretty good. But lots of people are talking about, hey, I want to have that um, that seven figure W2, that's at 300%. That's massive overachievement. And that doesn't happen often. So it's not predictable to owners in general, the bigger the company gets and, and closer it gets to being a public company. We more and more, we become a cost of sales. That's how they see us. This is actual data about where reps actually wind up. Even when their comp plans have these amazing kickers in them. Remember less than 50% are hitting quota. It's designed this way. This is part of the plan. We want to be high into the right, but the plan is working against us. Are you getting mad yet? Are you seeing this? This is the reality that we live in, okay? Now, if you make a comparison of a run rate seller, they're going to do a bunch of small deals and at a million dollar target, they're, they're going to miss. But, a, but an elite seller who does larger deals will do fewer of them and kill their number. This isn't even mega dealer. This is just somebody who's doing larger deals. When we make 102% at most of the companies that we, that we work for, what do we get? A $37 trophy and maybe enough commission to change the balding tires on our, on, on our minivan? I mean, our spouse might love it, but can anybody relate? When we work our tails off and we hit the number, but after tax, what we get back is far from our aspirations. Now, I know this is a bit tongue in cheek. And I don't want you to get too depressed because the truth is, is that we all have choices. You can make the choice to break out, but to do it, you got to buck the system. Now, let me give you an example. Gunnar Schock bucked the system. He was a 27 year old seller. His first year at Dynatrace, his average deal size was 150 K after working together. He three months later, he closes a $3.8 million deal. He was 25 X over He's rookie of the year at Dynatrace. <clears throat> the lesson, the takeaway from Gunner's story is that you've got to break out. You've got to get away from run rate sales and get into the world of mega deals. If you don't, if you're, we all need courage, right? We need the courage to forge our own way out of this matrix. You, you, you saw the movie. It, it, it's a red pill, blue pill choice. Now, secret number two how to get executive meetings and start mega deal sales cycles. Now, even if you don't feel confident in front of executives, 
So here's the truth. I've never seen a mega deal done without an executive sponsorship. There's too much entropy. There's too much fear of change in customer organizations for a mid-level person, low-level person to stick their neck out. They don't even have the mandate to do that. For big investments, the only stakeholders that can make it happen are at the executive level. But tell, tell me if you're like this, most reps feel intimidated by the executive sale. I'm just a rep. What could I even say to an executive? Anybody feel like that? Maybe you don't feel comfortable speaking to executives. You feel like you aren't experienced enough or old enough or aren't smart enough. You don't fit in with that group, whatever. But whatever it is that makes you feel uncomfortable, it's my job tonight and beyond to break those limiting beliefs and empower you to sell to executives. How important is this mindset shift? It's everything. The sense of feeling way below an executive's level and not knowing their language are huge barriers, self-imposed barriers to becoming an executive seller. Now, this is just a graphic to show here's where you need to be. Most of us spend our time below the line. We're working with mid-level managers and worker bees. But where we need to be is at the executive level because they've got the mandate and the ability to make those big deals happen. Now, a big chunk of what I do is called executive whispering, and that's helping, execs, uh, helping reps do four things. Connect with senior executives, engage them in serious business conversation, maintain access to the exec during the sales cycle, and build them into champions. Here is the biggest secret weapon, which is right out in front of us. Leverage your own executives. You know, are you one of those sellers who are uncomfortable in, in, in selling to executives, being in front of executives? If so, this is how you get started because you're not on your own. You're riding shotgun with one of your own executives who already has peer business status with the executive that you're selling into. You, you go with them, you watch what they do, and you play along. Now, I'm watching the clock. I want to make sure we stay on time here. Here's, here's a little mind shift that I want to happen right now for you guys. Most sellers, we see ourselves as mountain climbers and we believe that it is our job to take every step up the mountain to go get in front of that guru, that, that, that executive on the top of the mountain within our accounts. This is not the way to go. We're on the clock. If we're gonna make big deals happen in a 12 month period, we have to leverage other assets. Don't be a mountain climber. Be a heliskier. What does a heliskier do? They don't walk up the mountain. That takes weeks. They go leverage in a helicopter to take them to the top of the mountain in 10 minutes. And then they spend the rest of the day skiing down the other side. This is the way of the mega dealer. And your executives are your first port of call to be your helicopter. So your first assignment after this session is to stop behaving like a mountain climber, start thinking like a heliskier. All right. Another case in point, Andrew Holtorf. He was from a customer service background in his, fir in his first uh, sales role. He plugged along in that role for five years selling to lower level people. And he was doing 10 to 40 K deals at check. One of his teammates did a bigger deal, did a six figure deal. And that lit a fire under him. And then he came to me and then we started to work together. And in, Week eight of our work together, he went from doing 40K deals to 185. Now, you might not think 185K is a mega deal, but how would you like to 5X your average deal size in eight weeks? It's tremendous stuff. And he did it. He, 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 his unlock was how to get to and engage with executives. That is the power of learning this skill. Now, the last story that I got before I finish this secret is from Tyler. We'll just call him Tyler. He was behind. Is anybody behind in your number this year? Then you're just like this guy, Tyler. His SVP was bought into doing larger deals, but his first line manager was a very transactional manager. Basically, what he did is he found a way to connect his CTO with the customer CTO. And that ultimately led to discussions and relationships that help him close a 10x deal which yielded a deal of 14,000 seats. And he went from zero to hero in one deal. 
And he showed his whole organization, his whole selling organization, that mega deals are for normal people like you and me. It's not just for these prima donna sellers who we, we seem to think have some kind of innate uh, ability to sell. That's the end of the second secret. I think it's time for a message from our good friends at Apollo. It is. It is. And if you don't mind stopping the share, I'm going to start sharing my screen and I'm going to show uh, some things that I think are probably super useful. First of all, <clears throat> guys, if you can't, if you haven't been trying to leverage your executives to get into your target accounts, highly recommend you do that. But not every account that you're going to try and sell into, you have a first degree connection, right? That's what I want to talk about. I want to show you guys three ways to use Apollo to try and break into your your 20% of accounts that are going to give you the 80% of your commissions and of your uh, of the money in your pocket. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. We're actually going to hop into Apollo. Uh, so give me one second. Now, I, I do want to start by saying something. Uh, we actually, I don't know if a lot of people know about this. We have a community in Apollo. Uh, it's a Slack community where a lot of Apollo users are sharing their tactics and techniques for what is working. So uh, I'm actually just going to share a ticker really quickly uh, along the bottom of your screen where you can join our Slack group. If that's something you're interested in, you want to connect with other sellers and learn uh, the best ways of using Apollo, then I highly recommend you click the ticker. But uh, if I can figure out how to use my own computer, I'm actually going to dive into Apollo really fast. So, OK, Jamal talked about using the uh, executives at your own company to hella ski into accounts. But you don't always have that connection. So there are three ways that I have been successful breaking into bigger accounts. And I haven't closed $56 million deals. My biggest deal is well into the six figures. Uh, but I've seen this work for other folks as well. So the first thing I want to talk through is you go through all of this work to close a deal with an executive. But executive tenure at companies is actually pretty short. Um, it's actually like depending on the type of executive, let's say you're a VP of sales, it's 18 months. VP of marketing, right around the same. A CMO, same. CFO, about two years. What that means is your executives are constantly changing jobs, which can be hard to keep track of. So you go through all of this effort to close a deal with an executive, but then they change jobs on you. That's actually an opportunity to close another deal with the same person at a different company. And Apollo can help you stay on top of all of those people who are changing jobs. It's kind of hidden. Uh, not a lot of people know how to do it in the platform. So I want to show you. There's, there's really like two steps or two ways you could do this. The first way is what I would recommend. It's actually connecting your CRM to Apollo and pulling in all of your existing customer data to the Apollo platform so that Apollo can keep up to date uh, all of the all of the job information for your buyers. So the way you would do that, you would hit settings in the top right hand corner. You would then go to integrations. And I think I'm going to I'll make this a little bit bigger if you guys want to see more of my screen. OK, so you're going to go to integrations. And if you don't, if you're like an SDR and you don't have admin permissions in your CRM, you can ask your sales manager or your Salesforce administrator to do this. But Apollo supports two CRM integrations today, Salesforce and HubSpot. Uh, pipe drive is on the way. Don't tell anybody I told you it's coming. And I don't want to go super in depth on how to configure these. We have videos on that in the knowledge base, which is knowledge.apollo.io. Okay. So if you want to go to knowledge.apollo.io, my team actually runs this. You can click on integrations and we have a ton of videos on how to configure these. But what you need to know is, let's say Salesforce, for example, I can pull records into Apollo from Salesforce. I can map who my customers are, those fields in Salesforce. I can push that into Apollo too. And then I can give Apollo permission to push updates back into my Salesforce. What that does for you, I'm just going to show you. When you've connected your CRM, if I come over here on the left and I go to search, you know where you guys are all very familiar in Apollo, uh, all of the people in my CRM are going to appear in the saved contacts list. Okay. Now, also, all of the people who I've prospected before in Apollo will appear in the saved contacts list. So what you would want to do is come to more filters at the bottom here, and you can pull in that custom field criteria from your CRM. OK, so everybody's got one that's like, you know, opportunity is closed one or lead stage is one or whatever. You would pull that in here 
And that's how you're going to look at only existing customers, right? Or previous customers. But then what you would do, so you're going to come into that, you're going to come into that saved tab right here. And it's this button right here on the right. It looks like a little, uh, it looks like a little briefcase. If I click on it, it says show new job changes. And I can click on that. What this is showing me is of the 700,000 people in my CRM and who I've saved in Apollo, 2,000 of them have a new job. And this is like one of the fastest ways to break back into a big account that you've already broken into once before, or that someone else at your company has broken into, right? Like it's all fair game. If somebody closes a deal with the CFO, CFO changes jobs, different company, different account, you should go, go close that CFO again. Uh, and I'll show you exactly how to narrow it down. So there's 2000 people who potentially have changed jobs. I can come into filters and I can apply the same filters I would use if I was building a new search list, right? So I can just type in CFO, let's say I'm selling to CFOs. I can hit apply filters. Now I've narrowed this down to 42 people. And I just want to call something out. Like I'll, I know a lot of people like to use uh, tools like Apollo to send a high volume of emails. If you want to break into bigger accounts and close six figure deals and above, you really have to focus on quality over quantity. I think it's going to be really hard to break into the C level with a templated cold email, for example. But what I've just done is I've taken my existing customers. I found all of the ones who bought from me before who now have a new job. And you can go through these one at a time and see what's changed. And you can see right here, Apollo is actually telling me, hey, Ruben McDougall, used to be the CFO and is now the director and audit committee chair of a different company. And I can go through all of these and like some of them are going to be more legit than others. I'll just be real with you. Some of these, you know, people add stuff to their LinkedIn. They're like, oh, now I'm on the board of a nonprofit. Now I'm doing this. Now I'm doing that. But a lot of these are going to be gold. And I'll take one example. Let's just pick this guy, David Loretta. If I click on David, what I'll see is that He's the CFO at the Honest Company. But if I scroll down, earlier this year, he was the CFO at Duluth Trading Company. So this is a CFO who bought from me in the past, who changed jobs. Now is an opportunity for me to reach out to him, close a new deal at a new company. Okay. So that's the first thing I want to show you guys. Uh, and let me know in the chat if that's useful for you. I've got two more that I can show you how to break into mega deals using Apollo. So the first one was, let's find all of the people who have changed jobs that I've sold to before. Okay, second one. Um, I want you to get inside the mind of an executive, okay? So at the C-level, what's happening is, like I mentioned that those that tenure is pretty short, right? You've got uh, you know 18 months or two years. The reason for that is that a company hires a new C-level executive and immediately the company is like, you need to produce for Results, right? If you if you spend all that money to hire a C-level executive, that person has to start producing results for the company, which means there's an ideal time to reach out to those people. So here's what I like to do. Uh, I'm going to come back into my search tab in Apollo, okay? Um, and hang on, let me just get my bearings here for a second. So I'm going to come back into my search tab. And what I want to do is I'm, I'm starting again from my net news. So like, I'm running a new search. Uh, I'm gonna hit more filters. I don't know, Apollo's being slow for me. I'm gonna hit more filters. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to time and current role. This is one of my favorite, absolute favorite filters in Apollo. The ideal time to reach out to an executive is after they've gotten established at the company, but before they've had the chance to rebuild all of the systems and processes. So. I'm gonna look for people who have been at the company for at least two months, meaning they've got their bearings, they're not in onboarding, they're not just trying to figure out what the heck is going on, but no more than one year, that they're there between two months and one year, okay? So now I can go ahead and I can add my CFO title, and that's gonna bring me CFOs who are within the first year on the job. And let's just say, for example, I'm gonna to go to this industry and keywords filter, I'm gonna go one level deeper, Let's say I sell to commercial real estate and logistics. These are two big industries that are not super sexy, uh, but that are super important. Okay, this is where I wanna take you to the 99th percentile where no one is prospecting like this, okay? There's one more filter I'm gonna add. So I'm in the head of my executive. I've got a CFO in the first year on the job and 
they are hiring a controller. Now, this is me understanding my buyer. The controller is the person who reports in to the CFO or the VP of finance. What this means, and, and I can apply this to anything, that's the CFO, but it could be a VP of sales hiring a director of sales development or a director of sales, okay? What I'm trying to figure out is, who is the exec who came in and cleared house? This guy came in and, or, or girl, this person came in and fired somebody and is rebuilding their team. Now, this is an opportunity for me to get into their buying cycle because they're rebuilding their team and they're rebuilding their processes, okay? So I narrowed down from 30,000 people to two people. And if I really want to close mega deals, that's what I need to be doing. I need to get out of a spray and pray mentality. I need to get out of a volume mentality and get into a targeted mentality, okay? So now I'm going to show you, that's, that was second, the, the second tip. So I wanted to show you how to find a C-level exec first year on the job who's hiring the people under them. This is a perfect opportunity to reach out and figure out, hey, what are your plans? I know you're rebuilding your team. I know you're rebuilding your processes. How can I help you? Okay. But there's a third level down. Let's be real with each other. It's going to be hard to get on Bradley's calendar. I can hit this. I can get his email address. I can get his phone number. I can cold email him. I can cold call him. But it's hard to sell into the C-suite cold. So I want to take you one level deeper to the 99.99 percentile. Okay. There's a person at this company who controls Bradley's calendar. And 99% of the time, sellers are ignoring that person. I'm going to show you how to find it. And I, I'm going to like pause for a second because I want to give you guys uh, a really awesome example of someone who did this and made literally like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars from it. There's this guy named Kit Chandra. Um, and I'm going to put a ticker across the screen. Kit Chandra was one of the highest performing reps in the history of Twilio, which is a huge company. He managed some of their biggest accounts. We did a profile with Kit on the Apollo magazine uh, as part of the world's best sellers. And this is basically, I'm going to show you in Apollo right now, Kit's method for getting on the calendar of a C-level executive. So what Kit did is remember right how I got here. I found the CFO of a logistics company, first year on the job, hiring a controller. Okay. I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit them up. I'm going to try and get on their calendar, but I'm also going to go to the company and I'm going to go to where it says employees 570 and I'm going to hit that. Uh, and this is going to take me to a place right here in Apollo. Oh, and I've, I gave it away. This is going to take me to where I can see all of the employees who Apollo has at that company. And if I hit open filters, now I'm just searching the 98 people at that company, right? And this is the move. I want to reach out to the executive assistant. The executive assistant is the person who controls the C-level calendar. And your job as a seller at this moment, and here I have one, this is Grace. My job as a seller is to become Grace's best friend. So what Kit did is he cold called the, the uh, executive assistant. He cold emailed the executive assistant. And the tip I have for you right now is, when selling into like the executive assistant, they can't buy your service or product, but they can get you on the calendar of their boss. And Kit's entire move, which if you read this, uh, the, the ticker I'm sending right now, Kit's move was to befriend them and to say to them, hey, I know it's your job to keep me from getting on your boss's calendar, but here's why I think it's valuable. Uh, and when it came time for the holidays, he'd send a gift. Every month, he'd make a call. Over the course of three or four months, he got meetings with every single EA that he was trying to sell to. That led to multiple millions of dollars worth of deals. So those are three tips I have for using Apollo to break in to these mega deals. I hope they're useful. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing Kit's story. Really quickly, what I'm going to do, if you're not currently on a professional or a custom plan of Apollo, I highly recommend you get on one. It gives you more credits, more access to mobile numbers, more access to filters, more access to everything. So I'm going to briefly open a poll and you can say yes if you want to talk to somebody about a custom plan of Apollo. In the meantime, I'm actually going to hop into the Q&A and take a couple questions. So I'm just going to run this poll for like a minute or two uh, and then I'm going to take some questions. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. Jamal, maybe you can help me take a couple of these questions. And also guys, we're not done. Jamal has one more He's got one more secret, which is super tactical about how to actually bring these mega deals in the door. So don't touch that dial. 
Um, okay. Jamal, here's one for you. Is from Robert. Is there any advice for cold outreach to executives? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you break down the world of outreach, there's warm and there's cold. I'm a huge fan of warm because it pre-frames us in a very positive way, leveraging the existing relationships of the person who's doing the inter introducing. But sometimes we can't find anybody who can be that bridge between us and the executor we're trying to get to. Here is my view of cold outreach. Um, just one example. I had a call with a CIO a couple of weeks ago. And he said, Jamal, I get, no joke, 400 unsolicited emails a week. Wow. What do you think the chances are that even if you took three hours to craft the best email that you could, what is the likelihood that an already overworked CIO is going to open your email in those 400 unsolicited emails? The lesson for me is that cold email and cold phone are like super highways that are bumper to bumper jam packed. We need to get off of those super highways. We need to go to other channels, which are other people, which, which gets us more into warm. But if you're going to do cold outreach, I highly recommend creative outreach. Creative outreach, kind of the easiest one to think about is something through the mail, something through the post. Even it is as simple as, as, as a greeting card, but it can get super um, creative. You know, I mean, it could be, uh, you know, some, if it's local, you could uh, find out somebody's birthday and, and, and take them a cupcake on their birthday with a little note. Or you can yep. smell, you, you, I, I could go on forever, but the long story short is creative outreach is much more impactful and much more successful because it's not on the super highway that's jam packed. I love that. I'm going to close this poll in about 30 seconds, guys, so we can continue with the content. I'm going to share one more story. Very similar vein. I used to work for a construction technology company and construction executives are really, really hard to get in touch with, uh, especially over email and over cold call. I did something crazy and I'd, I'd recommend for those of you trying to break into big accounts, try this as well. I, there was a company that made wooden crates of beef jerky, okay? This is actually insane. So I bought 20 wooden crates of beef jerky and they weren't huge, they were small. They're like a little small crate of beef jerky. I sent, I had them all delivered to my office. I went and wrote a letter to each of those uh, people on my list and I included it, I opened the crate and I put it in the crate. And the letter was like, hey, I've been trying to get in touch with you. I know you don't wanna to talk to me. I thought you and your team might like this beef jerky. Here's my phone number. I sent 20 crates of beef jerky. It took me way longer than I thought it would. It was actually insane. Uh, I got 13 calls back. I'd been trying to get on these people's calendar for a year, no success. Cut through the noise, beef jerky crates. It took me some time. I had to get some budget from my team. Uh, but it absolutely worked. So I had another campaign that I, I'll talk about at some point in the future where I got a robot to hand write a thousand letters. It was actually crazy. But that's the end of, uh, of that story and that poll. Jamal's going to take it away with his third secret. And then we're going to come back into our, uh, into our Q&A. And we'll take Q&A for about 15 minutes at the end of the call. So Jamal, um, please share your screen and take it away, my friend. All right. So secret number three how to get customer executives intellectually chasing you so you can get a mega deal in flight even if you don't have the best book of accounts. So here's what's going on. Um, this secret three is really critical because there are some run rate sellers who might get to an executive, but without something really impactful to say, they're just gonna get kicked down the other side. And the last thing that a senior executive wants to hear are discovery questions like what keeps you up at night and you know what are your biggest pains, et cetera. You're supposed to know that in advance. Or when we parrot a lot of the template materials that we get from within our own companies, which is great for describing the product or the market, but it has nothing to do with that customer's specific reality. So what are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to say? What's the story that you can craft to get the attention of senior executives well enter the mega deal premise what do i mean by mega deal premise well a mega deal premise has three components first component 
is what we call the core imperative. What's a core imperative? It's what your customer's C-suite has parroted, has projected to the market or to their investors or to their stakeholders. Here are the top three to five things that need to be achieved this fiscal year. They're core, they're core imperatives, things that have to happen. High, high priority. The second component of a mega deal premise is the distinctive value proposition that your company offers. Sometimes there's something distinctive in your product. Sometimes it's how it's delivered. Sometimes it's the, um, the, the tenure of your team or your ability to get your customer implemented and in the market as quickly as possible. I say distinctive value pro proposition instead of unique value proposition because it's really, really hard to be unique. So I say distinctive value proposition. The third component is a C-level insight. What is a C-level insight? A C-level insight is an undiscovered or underappreciated reality about your customer's business. So what do I mean by that? Let's go a little bit deeper. We, we all know that insights are really impactful when we can unearth them, but there are different kinds of insights. They're not all created equal. There are different levels of impact. So for example, you could find or, or, or generate an impact or a, an insight that would have impact across a manager's scope, which is like a team, right? Five to 10 people. If you can make that um, insight stick and map it to your product or service, you're going to get a small deal, like 20K deal, 50K, something like that. However, if you up level your insight to something that the, the scope of the impact of the insight is for a VP, you get where this is going, you're going to get a mid-sized deal. But when you have a C-level insight that can impact the entire organization, the entire enterprise, that's when you get into the single and double and triple million dollar deals. So the insight really, really matters. Now, there are, whoops. <clears throat> now, how do these pieces play together? So the core imperative is the goal, right? And so you could consider it the destination that the customer is trying to get to. The distinctive value proposition, it's your job to show the customer that your distinctive value proposition is the right vehicle, the best vehicle, better, cheaper, faster, to get them to their core imperative. And the way that the story lends itself is by coming from this C-level insight that, that uh, is the rationale, that's the reason why, that's the discovery of the needle in the haystack that links what they're trying to achieve with how you get there with your distinctive value proposition. So the C-level insight is the moneymaker because it's compelling, it's measurable, it's proven, it has significant impact, and um, it hits the mandates that senior executives are trying to achieve, not the lower level folks. So if you want to put together a high level formula for how to do mega deals, number one, learn executive whispering, which is the art and science of working with executives on both sides of the table, both yours and your customers, as well as learn how to craft a mega deal premise which is a value story that senior executives are going to listen to, have not heard before, and can justify big spend based on measurable uh, justification uh, of value. That is the mega deal uh, formula. And that's all I had for now. So I know you got something next that you want to do, Josh. So if you want to take over. Yeah, if you want to stop sharing your screen, everybody who stayed with us, Thank you for being here. We're not quite done yet. I'm going to run a quick poll right now. If you want to talk to Jamal, okay? So obviously I want you to take a demo of Apollo, but Jamal has a masterclass on closing mega deal secrets. If you're interested in connecting with Jamal, please say yes to the poll. We'll put you in touch with them. And also, if you really want to talk to Jamal like now, I'm going to run a ticker really quickly um, where you can actually book time uh, with Jamal uh, and uh, you'll see it go across your screen. You'll be able to book time with Jamal uh, right after this call. So if you click the ticker, it's going to take you to where you can book time on his calendar or you can actually join a Zoom. Is that right, Jamal? Like you're going to go to a Zoom right after this? 
Th- that's right. So if you click the ticker that says talk with Jamal, you're going to have two choices. If you're ready to hear about this special offer that I put together to work together with the folks just who are on this call, you can, the option number one is go to another Zoom room. And as soon as this session's over, I'm going to be there. I'll tell you all about it. Awesome. If you've got something that you need to do right now, but you want to talk a little bit later, you have a second option, which is to book a call within the next couple of days. Okay, we're going to run that while we take Q&A. First one from Steven. Jamal, can you please reiterate your three secrets? Yeah, so number one is really all about executive whispering. It's getting to, well, the first secret is really you're you're never going to break out and have breakout success if we keep playing by the rules of the game, which means we have to break out of run rate selling. And run rate selling is, Cold, dis- cold outreach with the goal of getting a discovery call. The discovery call sets up a demo. And then after the demo, you just pray that somebody calls you back. This is not going to work and it's not going to get you to where you want to be. That's secret number one. Secret number two is we have to learn how to sell above the clouds. When we spend all of our time with low level folks at the worker B level or at the mid-level manager level, it's going to take us a long time to close small deals. But when we get above that line and we sell with executives, bigger deals happen faster when executives are the sponsors. And the third is how to craft the value story. I call this special value story a a mega deal premise. And it has these three components of understanding what's super important to senior executives this fiscal year and creating an insight or unearthing an insight that shows why your solution or service is the best, cheapest, fastest, most appropriate, best choice way for the customer to achieve that core imperative. Those are the three secrets. Awesome. Thank you for the quick recap. Really found that valuable. Um, Okay. I had a couple I'm going to take. Somebody is asking, uh, is Apollo recommended for, this is for Pierre, is Apollo recommended for a small startup of three? I would say absolutely yes. It's the best solution for a company of that size. I think the pro plan is probably your best bang for your buck. Comes in at, I think it's under $100 a seat per month. So check that out. We have a, there's like a button at the top of your screen right now. Request pro plus demo, hit that and we'll hook it up. Um, Okay, so Erica is asking, how do we find where to send someone mail with remote work? Interestingly, about 70% of people are actually back in the office most of the time. So I think mailing the company is still a valid way. Um, For the remainder of people, the post office actually sells people's addresses. I don't know if you knew this. If you just Google like buy people's addresses, there's a bunch of companies where you can can buy the addresses of people if you already have their name and where they live. So I would recommend checking that out. Um, Okay, Jamal, we had a question from earlier How did you go from getting fired to Oracle taking a chance on you? It's a really good question. I got in, I really think, so the the worst manager of my life was my first manager at Oracle. And I was prepped by the the recruiter that got me in there. He he looked at my resume because I had bumped around and he's like, well, it's not like you worked at Oracle for 10 years. (laughs) And, And it was because I had bumped around but he still put me in front of this guy. And I think that I got my shot because this guy couldn't hold a team and he had to get somebody in the role by a, so I basically got lucky. I don't have a silver bullet on how to break into a, to a a big account, but it's, so if it's not performance-based, you have to have a really amazing interview and do a heck of a lot of research in advance. It's a longer story, but that's kind of the highlights. Love it. Um, For the audience, I'm going to close this poll in 10 seconds. So if you want to talk to Jamal, say yes or click on the talk to Jamal ticker. Uh, I have a couple more things I'm going to run for you guys. So, you know, counting down nine, eight, seven. I'm bad at counting. I'm going to close it here in a second. Uh, But we're going to continue taking your questions until Goldcast kicks us out of here. Um, Okay, so the poll's closing. Uh, All right. I'm going to reopen really quickly uh, the Apollo poll, just in case any of you guys are sticking around and you do want to take a look at Apollo. Uh, We're going to keep going with the Q&A. Okay, Jobin, yes, you do not have to be working at an organization to use Apollo. You can pay for Apollo yourself uh, or you can get a free plan. So highly recommend you do that. Nick is asking, what do you recommend instead of cold outreach? So, 
you know, if I understand you correctly, Jamal, I think it's uh, the first and foremost is try and get an introduction from a C-level exec, right? Uh, exactly. I mean, cool. and there's so much value in what you just showed with Apollo in terms of researching relationships that already exist, researching people that have left. Um, it, it's a long story, but basically I overinvest in trying to get warm introductions and it's like slowing down to speed up because I think, you know, you know, one warm introduction is worth about three months of cold outreach. And so wherever I can get it, it gets me further faster. And I'm pre-framed by somebody who already has, who's already known, liked, and trusted by the person that I'm trying to get to. So the first thing I do is I go to my own executives and I say, here's my accounts. Here's the people I'm trying to get to. Do you know any of these people? And if that doesn't work, then I say, can you give me access to our board of advisors? And if, and I go to them and I go to the same thing. And then if I don't get anything there, or if I do, and I just want to continue, then I say, can you give me a board, uh, uh, access to some of the board of directors? And I just keep going. And then I go to the uh, investors. And then once I do all those, those are the most people who are the most aligned with me in terms of wanting me to sell a lot of software. After that, then I go to the ecosystem. There's a ton of players in the ecosystem between you and the customer, whether they're um, uh, integration partners, boutique uh, consultants, other sellers, other reps that sell complementary software or, or tech to the same stakeholder base. There's lots of ways of going to get um, warm introductions. And it's, honestly, it's tools like Apollo that can really help you kind of unearth those. Love that answer. Um, if I could add to it, yeah, I think the warm introductions are really valuable. And also, I was just talking with the former enterprise sales director at LinkedIn she always tells a story where somebody on our, her team reached out to the, an executive at another company that they were not trying to sell to and asked for an introduction to an executive at a company they were trying to sell to. This like being willing to slow down to go fast wow. and got the intro, right? Got an intro from a cold exec and the email was just like, can you please introduce me to so-and-so? That was the subject line. And the email was like, hey, listen, like here's who I am is what I'm doing. Can you please introduce me to this person? Obviously it's not gonna work every time, but it will work sometimes. Um, uh, Jamal, J Zach, Jack, great name, had a question for you. Can you give a real life example of a C-level insight, uh, from secret number three? How much time do we have? We two are, minutes. we got two minutes and 38 seconds. This is, this is the example that I give and I use it because it, it, it's simplified and you can find this example. Anybody read the book, uh, the challenger customer, it's a great story in the challenger customer. Basically. It's about a company called Densply. Densply was a, uh, a manufacturer of medical devices. One of the things that they sold was a, um, a tooth cleaner. They made such an amazing tooth cleaner that nobody bought it because it was too expensive. They were selling to uh, mid-level managers, which were the office managers of dental locations. Um, they completely changed their go-to-market and they built a C-level insight for C level of, a, of, of dental practices. So instead of saying, hey, office manager, here's the best tool in the world, they went to the owners of the clinics and they said, hey, Dr. So-and-so, we wanna show you some research that we've done about the number one risk to clinic profitability. They got tons of meetings and they basically said, here's what we found. Uh, clinic profitability is being, the greatest risk to it is employee absenteeism. I'm just going to cut this down short. Employee absenteeism is happening mostly with dental hygienists. The cause of it is from carpal tunnel syndrome more than anything else, more than COVID, more than anything is carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is happening because of the way that they have to contort themselves to do their job. And the, the way that the tool works, is too, it, it's too heavy, it vibrates, it's not shaped right. Ultimately, they basically created a link by saying, holy cow, are you saying that the profitability of my business is linked to what tool we use for tooth cleaners. Where can I get a better tool? That was a C-level insight that showed that only their tool was going to solve a C-level problem. That's the best example I got in two minutes. I love that. Guys, we are at time, 34 seconds left. Uh, I wholeheartedly appreciate all of you who've stayed with us to the end. Jamal, thank you so much. For everybody who is a fan of these webinars, our next webinar 
is with Sam McKenna on how to get anyone to open and reply to your cold email using a framework called Show Me You Know Me. We're gonna be demoing some brand new Apollo functionality as well. Thank you all, we love you all. We'll see you next time. Have a great rest of your day.